glad to join us in our series, and we appreciate having you come to the series in which we're trying to expose both our students and those of you from the surrounding areas to pretty much what's taken place in the area of architecture in Southern California during the past 30 years. Usually, we end at Neutra and Schindler, and that's the end of the history of Southern California. But uh, many outstanding architects have worked here for the past 20, 30 years, and we've been trying to uh, expose you to this kind of work. Tonight, Carl Maston, who will be speaking to you, is an especially important architect to me. Uh, when I came out of the university, I spent most of my apprentice years with Carl, and probably, although it's hard to say this in an educational institution, I probably learned more at that point in my life than I had through my years at the University of California. Uh, Carl, at that time, was a, and still is, I guess, a young architect who uh, was already well known for his residential work and especially well known for his garden apartments. Uh, through the last 20 years or so, Carl has continued to do excellent work. He's won many awards. Uh, they've been in the areas, residential areas, apartment areas, and such diverse other types of building projects as uh, precast, on-site, uh, concrete ice skating rink, uh, low-cost housing project, a uh, university architectural school building. And uh, he has a very small office and a very personal office, but a very excellent one. For 12 years, Carl also taught at the University of Southern California. And uh, he has been very active also in the American Institute of Architects. He's been the president. He's been uh, elected to fellowship for design. And he's, uh, again, I say, a very special person to me and a very special architect in the Los Angeles area, Carl Maston. He's asked me to say, <laughs> before he comes up, he would like it to be a very casual evening and, and quite open as he does show his slides and would like questions, interjections, and, and so forth. Thank you. Carl? If you'd wear this, this picks you up on the video better. So. What, do we really need this? I got a loud voice. <laughs> you, it, do, it doesn't do any oh. good for you that way. It only, only picks yeah. you up on the video. All right. And then you got that, and I'll leave you. What do I do? Oh, this is a forward and this reverse. Right. <laughs> Thank you, Ray. This is an especially heartwarming occasion for me to come back. Not come back, but to come here the first time uh, to meet with you. And Ray, as Ray indicated, we've had a long and very pleasant and I believe fruitful relationship over many years, too many years to, uh, for him to call me the young architect anymore, as much as I'd like <laughs> flatter to hear that. But uh, <coughs> I hope we both are, and I'm, sh I'm sure Ray is still young in spirit, and I hope I am. Uh, I don't know how you can continue to be a self-respecting architect unless you can maintain uh, a high degree of vigor and youthfulness in your intellectual approach to this kind of work. What I'd like to uh, start off with is just a few personal observations because uh, I can't see but, but that a discussion and a meeting of this kind can be anything but very subjective and personal. We're talking about an, an art form. It isn't a uh, an objective matter of building science alone. It's uh, how, how a certain individual uh, approaches his work and what are the guiding stones he has found over a period of years to help him, whether it's valid for everyone else or for everyone else to consider himself. Uh, all I can do is tell you my own thoughts as, as to the design process. As some of you may know, there was a, I suppose you'd call it a symposium or a panel discussion, a workshop at Berkeley a number of years ago on the very matter of design process. And they've had various famous architects come and submit to a number of tests 
and uh, it wasn't carried on long enough to end up in any serious determinations or conclusions. Um, it's unfortunate this hasn't actually been the, the subject for more serious discussion because this is what it's all about. How do you, as a student, uh, you've got to determine in your own life, how do you go about putting into your head that which you need to have in order to make the kind of decisions that will lead to the answers you'll want as an architect or, or a designer or a planner or whatever your uh, chosen goal is. Uh, of course, all I can do to this evening is to uh, just give a few personal observations of uh, a fairly, a very humble architect. I, uh, I don't say that in undue modesty. It's, I say that out of uh, consideration that throughout my life, my standards have been so much higher than my performance that I've never uh, been able to say that I've done a building that comes close to being uh, com completely satisfying to me. And I don't expect to ever reach that point. And, uh, as a matter of fact, I think any architect that says he's completely satisfied with what he's done, uh, he's, he's got to be dead or stupid. <coughs> <coughs> There's been a lot of uh, discussion about the relationship between drawing ability and design. And um, one reason I think we can be misled by the simple or rather simplistic statement that uh, a good architect has to be an excellent draftsman is the fact that most architects are working in an art form and naturally their drawing is, a, their, is a, his means of communication and he will, as an artist he will take pride in doing that so that most famous architects that you know have been fairly facile and uh, good at their uh, drawing. You can go all the way down uh, the line Frank Lloyd Wright, Richard Neutra, uh, Bill Rudolph. Um, there's a long line of people. Ray Cappy. Uh, I have a big file of my old drawings, and it's always a pleasure to uh, have occasion to dig into some project that people have asked me about. Quite often, as you um, your buildings, when they're 20 years old, are sold, and the new owner wants to know what's electrical, where the electrical panels are and what's underground and so forth. So you have to dig those drawings out. And it's always a pleasure to uh, look up the drawings that Ray did. I, I don't think I've ever had anyone that uh, was a more brilliant draftsman as well as a good designer. But uh, the point I'm trying to make is that uh, there's a temptation to think that being a good draftsman will automatically ensure you being a good designer. And I think that far from reality as can be possible because uh, the good design has to be here. You use the, your drafting ability to communicate to others and also to record your own thoughts. It, uh, if a person had perfect visualization and a, a, an immense memory, he probably wouldn't have to draw at all except to communicate to others. But as you do your own work, uh, many thoughts come to mind and uh, if, if you don't record them, for yourself as you go, uh, you, you lose the ability of uh, working in a, in a direct and significant way. So you do have to record for yourself. But um, I think you should avoid trying to design by drawing it. There's a tendency to do a sort of a cut and try thing. If somebody gives you a program or a problem to design and you start get a pencil in your hand and you start uh, drawing out of the little memory you have of uh, certain building types that might be close to it. And 
what happens as you start drawing that thing without having completely thought it out in your mind and, and having researched it and analyzed it from a behavioral standpoint, from a structural standpoint, uh, in your mind, you, and you draw something without that comprehensive grasp of what the problem really is, you begin to crystallize. It's frightening how tough it is once you've uh, drawn something that looks pretty good to you at first blush, and then later on as facts come in and uh, other <coughs> thoughts creep in, you find it hard to get away from that initial set that's occurred. And then you become, begin to modify that thing rather than throwing it overboard and starting fresh. At least that's been uh, the experience I've had. And I, uh, because of that, I make a very firm effort to try to avoid uh, any premature crystallization of an idea until I've thought it all out and try to understand the people and their psychology, what they want if we're talking about a house, really understanding what these people's needs are, trying to understand the site and all its implications. And, and sometimes you do your best designing driving an automobile with <laughs> on a freeway where there's not too much distraction. It's uh, one reason why uh, a radio isn't always the best uh, thing to have. Uh, you'd be listening to that instead of uh, daydreaming. Of course, I've gotten an awful lot of traffic tickets that way, too. <laughs> In this uh, first, uh, in this uh, effort to arrive at a way of thinking about this program that you're going to have, I'm assuming you're doing a, some kind of a design problem that's been given to you either in school or afterwards as, as you practice your art. It's, it's my uh, conclusion that all buildings that you admire that have been done and probably ever will be done are ones that are based on w a very strong generating idea and uh, that that generating idea is going to come out of your mind not out of your the facility of uh, your hand with a pencil you're going to find that there's something uh, about this particular problem that is of overriding significance that should be expressed And uh, it may be a symbolic thing. If, it, if it's uh, a building like a church, it's, it may be just a symbolism rather than the actual reality of the building structure itself that uh, you are attempting to get. And uh, I suppose when you really get down to it, that's what art is about, is symbolizing something. Uh, you, you can do a building and approach it completely objectively as someone might build a bridge. Well, even in doing a bridge, there are some subjective decisions made. Maylar, who was probably the most famous bridge builder in the world, uh, certainly has made subjective decisions on the design of those beautiful uh, bridges in Switzerland. And. Uh, that fusion of engineering, science, and art that combines to make architecture such a fascinating pursuit. And it's, it's in pursuing uh, this one strong idea that will evoke a response from those who live in the building, see the building, or work in the building, uh, that to my mind produces uh, a work of architecture that's more than a a faddish piece of business that's clever for the day, but it's soon forgotten. And along with that comes your intuition, which is something that is you draw upon increasingly as you gain experience and maturity. And uh, since intuition is perceiving <coughs> rather quickly what is stored in your subconscious mind. Uh, it means that to be a good designer or artist, architect, means that you have to be as broadly cultured in your background as possible. Uh, uh, 
your exposure to all sorts of art, philosophy, reading, uh, all becomes stored in this subconscious self of yours so that when you do start to design now or 20 years or 50, 30 years later, what you do design will be because of the, the intuitive process that comes forth. Now, you may think I'm talking like a, uh, well, an, an arty sort of person, but uh, the one person who's convinced me that this is true in almost any endeavor that you take part in is Bucky Fuller. He's so fond of using this term as far as the way men think and operate that he's even called his own uh, sailboat uh, the intuition. He, he's constantly referring to intuition when he's talking uh, to people as to how he's arrived at certain conclusions, how why he did certain things. It, you don't draw on facts that uh, write on a piece of paper or that you're thinking of immediately. You're drawing upon a wellspring of uh, a lifetime uh, of experience. And, of course, that, um, as I say, it's a, it's a smaller wellspring as you're young and it becomes more profound if, as you grow older if you feed the right material into it. And that's why it behooves uh, an artist and just anyone in your profession to uh, cultivate that uh, intuition by what you feed into your mind. Uh, that gives the impression that uh, you will naturally become a, a greater and better designer as you get older, and that isn't exactly true either. You become more mature. Uh, another study that would be very interesting for some universities to take is the relationship between mathematics and what happens to a mathematician and an architect. Uh, most mathematicians, according to Einstein, are convinced that if they haven't produced anything significant by the time they're 27 years of age, they probably never will. Now, I don't think anybody can prove that about architecture, but there might be something to it. Uh, there's something about uh, uh, a youthful endeavor that uh, provides the innovative approach that uh, is quite often lacking after architects reach their older ages. They, they become better architects in, the respe in respect of doing things more knowledgeably, more refined, uh, more consistently, and with a greater degree of maturity. But the real thrust that, uh, and, and you'll see it in Wright's work, you see it in so many uh, people's work that they're, the thing that made them famous is the uh, this thrust that they uh, had in their youth that they developed to a greater refinement as they became older. Uh, getting back to Frank Lloyd Wright, I don't think anything has created his great reputation more than the prairie houses, which were done in his youth before he was 30. The Roby House is probably one of the most fantastic buildings in the world, the 20th century world, and it was done while Wright was a comparative young, terribly young man. Um, so that little bit, I think maybe we can uh, look at some of the pictures, and I wish you'd interrupt as often as you'd like because I'm. I'm not a lecturer, and I, I feel uncomfortable at it, and I would much rather just talk to you informally and answer questions. It would probably be more productive if you do have questions that we can talk about, but I will <coughs> have a few comments. I, am I in the way of the picture right here? Okay. Quite an appropriate one to start with because it represents uh, the first uh, real joint effort between Ray Cappy and myself. Uh, he had been uh, with me for a year or two and was 
itching as well as I was to try our hand at a small apartment project because it's so very difficult to do what you want to do, express the ideas you have with uh, most of the real world clients, particularly in the apartment house field. Uh, the cash register rings too loudly for them to uh, listen to architects very clearly. And uh, uh, Ray's father staked the two of us to a, a pair of lots on National Boulevard. And uh, we each designed our own buildings. But I think just naturally we had a compatible attitude and feeling for design so that uh, his building, which you just see the beginning of on the right, and uh, the one I did for myself, I think, make a uh, harmonious whole. I have no more pictures of it. As a matter of fact, I didn't even, I wasn't doing any for shooting of buildings. I don't think I even had a camera in those days. Uh, but fortunately, Julia Shulman had this one shot that I was able to get last week. And I should have taken time to have gotten a picture of Ray's uh, building. It would have been fun to show the two side by side as they really are. But uh, <coughs> the one um, idea that um, I say generated this thing, and you can't uh, see it from this slide because it just shows the front of the building and it doesn't tell the story at all, but it, it's a sloping hill and uh, it has five apartments. And I'd always been fascinated and impressed with an ancient system where and you can see it in the Roman and old Greek buildings in which the structure, uh, one single structure housed both the garden and the living quarters. The only difference being that the roof didn't extend over the uh, part of the structure that housed the, the garden. In this case, <coughs> this blank wall here is the garden portion and that to the right there is the living portion. And and there's five of these things that just follow in sequence, each one uh, high enough so that it has a, a slit window like that over the, the lower uh, r roof of the lower apartment. Let's try the next one. Uh, here's a couple of uh, slides of a house that's no great moment except they uh, illustrate a, a design idiom that a lot of us young architects at that time um, were engaged in and it uh, represents uh, uh, I think an offspring of the, the Bay Area redwood uh, post and beam construction. Here's another little apartment house that represents a slight variation of the same uh, Bay Area influence that was so great at that time. This is, do you remember about the year of that uh, when we were doing these apartments, Ray? That must have been uh, early 50s or late 40s. But, uh, The Bay Area, uh, I guess, influence was originally started by William Worcester and a few other people up in the San Francisco area and uh, was very strongly emulated and uh, it was a source of great influence to us down here. There's some pictures of the gardens that are related to the the apartment you just saw. Uh, that didn't have any transverse or covered or anything? Or did that cover the whole thing? That first one? The, the, the the um, let me see which one you mean. So that garden area, was that within the house? No, that's, that screens it from the other apartment. It's, uh, there are two uh, patios side by side uh, for two different apartments. And uh, the screening to give privacy to for one patio from the other consisted in this case of those uh, right, mm -hmm. the 
is uh, one of the early houses I did. Here's a ranch house. It was the first house I've uh, explored in which the I did the wall structures in concrete block, and I've been pursuing that ever since. It's a it's a rather humble material, but I think it can be quite nicely and nobly handled if, if it's used with some degree of sensitivity. It, um, I always have had a lack of satisfaction of the character of a, of, of a stud wall. It didn't seem to have the structural expressiveness uh, of, of either masonry or a skeletal, skeleton frame structure. You, well, I think you can, if you look in this building right now and see the, the space modules we've built, there's a, a clarity to a skeletal frame that you have here that gives a great deal of quality. And on the other extreme of building a structure, you can build with something that's fairly monolithic, either concrete or masonry, and you have something that has its own integrity and its own virtue, and uh, you feel that there's a quality to it uh, that I've never been able to get out of a stud and stucco building. I'll just go through some of these uh, real quickly. It's a house for a doctor in, in a orchard he has up in Ventura. This is the approach side, which is where most of your uh, block-bearing walls are notice noticeable. On the side towards the ocean overlooking the orchard, there's, uh, the block is mostly eliminated in favor of a, a redwood uh, curtain wall and glass. The house, um, as a contrast to the great open areas, have uh, some contrasting areas similar to this ingle nook around the fireplace in which uh, the only light is uh, sort of a token strip light. Um, but it, it affords a sort of a psychological foil to the great openness on the view side to be able to retire to a, a cozier enclosure. And uh, the kitchen is in a similar um, situation. You can see just one corner of it through there. Uh, this is a more recent little house that was designed in concrete block. Actually, it was for my sister out in the desert who teaches there. And uh, we couldn't get anyone to do concrete block uh, anywhere close to her budget until we had the house almost finished in stud and stucco and found a uh, man who works in a ho at a hotel half a day and was interested in doing masonry work uh, as sort of a moonlighting thing. And uh, he did all the walls enclosing the, uh, the yard. The coyotes are very rampant there and my sister has pets, and it was very important to her that, and I, I, um, I like the enclosed walls around the whole thing also as a means of separating <coughs> the artificial kind of landscaping that a person has around a house. As, uh, as I drove around, uh, many times I visited her in her older houses uh, that she lived in, there was uh, an awkward transition f from a person's <coughs> natural uh, inclination to plant have rose gardens and things like that, and they just don't uh, lend themselves to a transition to this beautiful desert. And by creating this artificial barrier, uh, one becomes man-made, and the other one excusing the road and so forth is pretty much the natural landscape. These are some other views of the same house. The um, thing I tried to achieve in this house in the desert was the very opposite of the, the glass box, which 
nowadays with our energy crunch has turned to be, uh, out to be quite a folly, that is the glass box has. Um, with models, I've tested the sun on this very site, and uh, the living room is a large two-story volume with glass to the south to allow the sun to come in because it's very, strangely enough, it's very necessary to have some warmth uh, most of the time in the desert except for May through October. But this, uh, to shield the sun from May to October, you can just begin to see the screen porch. It's a, a 12 foot wide extension. You can see it in another picture, I think. Or you can see more of it over there. It extends out 12 feet and it's designed so that when this, the sun from May to October will go into the screen porch but not just miss the, the glass surface 12 feet beyond, which is the limit of the living room. Of course, it's the scenery around there in the mountains that makes this, these pictures look so good. <laughs> There's that uh, screen porch. The screen porch wasn't designed only for the sun. It was, uh, she lived there about in that general area for about 10 years prior to my building this house for her. And every time we'd go out because of, and try to have dinner or cocktails out in the porch when the weather was beautiful, the bugs drove us inside, and so I swore that if I ever had a chance to design a house for her, I'd uh, take care of the bugs, and it, it, it proved very, very useful. This is a house that was done right after that, in which the people could afford the concrete block, and. Uh, It's um, the only <coughs> modern thing about this house, I would say, would be the interior spaces, which um, was this is, a, uh, I'll talk about this house, but the other one, that last house you saw there is um, a problem that I think an architect faces all the time as to whether his personal statement as to what he thinks of architecture can uh, completely override what a client is comfortable with. And of course, this situation becomes more acute when the clients are older people. Uh, we're not talking about this house. We're talking about uh, this one here, which you can just see part of a garden terrace. Uh, they were both retired people, a brother and sister. One was a retired banker and the other one, the, the woman was a retired school teacher and principal. And they'd lived in an older house all their life. Uh, they were adventuresome enough that they were willing to uh, taste something that uh, was more imaginatively designed, uh, has more open spaces. They, uh, as a matter of fact, they've always had bedrooms on the second floor, and, and the lady just felt that she wouldn't be secure without being on the second floor. Uh, so uh, you, you have the, if this were a younger couple, I think uh, an architect's duty would have been to explore this further and say, well, you're going to be able to adjust to this. This is uh, a phobia you have that has no reality, and you're going to learn to, uh, uh, open up your lifestyle to the to, uh, other experiences that are more drastic. But in this case, what I uh, ended up doing was having a house that's one story at the eave line, rising to two stories in the middle. And each bedroom, since it's not a married couple, is separated by a bridge. And that bridge spans the length of the living room. And both bedrooms look down into it so that they visually, I'm sorry that rather recent building, and I don't have pictures of the inside to show it, but uh, the bedrooms each experience the full extent of the ground floor and the gardens out below. It's, uh, it's almost the kind of thing where you have the mezzanine and the mezzanine here, uh, experiencing the total shape. While the, uh, the building is fairly solid except for the openings to the garden to the right and to the uh, uh, courtyard, 
which you see was a lattice between the roof there. Um, Uh, this is a house uh, that I unfortunately don't have too many pictures of, but it's a house designed on the um, principle of, uh, it was a, it's a dull lot. It's in South Pasadena, a very dull lot. People like to entertain. They're uh, young married people. Or he's a very successful advertising man who likes to entertain a great deal. And in this house, there's four elements. One of them, the living room den and den, two rooms. The master bedroom suite is a second element. The children's bedrooms are a third element. And the kitchen dining room form a fourth element in a pinwheel around a, uh, if it were a Mexican house, which it was designed after, uh, it would be an open patio in the middle, a, a, like a donut. Uh, but to make it usable, there's that clear story that runs a along and, and a roof so that it's an enclosed area lit by the clear story and that that uh, enclosed patio serves as circulation area, serves as entertaining area, and what have you. What was the roof on top of that It was a um, roof of <coughs> wood beams with a, a tectum ceiling, which served as a uh, roof structure as well. Are you familiar with tectum? It's, um, it looks like regurgitated spaghetti. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's fiber, wood fibers uh, held together with, uh, with cement, actually. And uh, at two to two and a half inches of thickness, it has a considerable strength as well as a great acoustical uh, quality for absorption of sound and it has a good deal of thermal value. So it, it really serves three purposes, or four purposes. Uh, it's a material I'm very fond of using. And uh, unfortunately, I don't have any um, interiors of it. This is a house that has a concrete structure throughout, except for the floor and roof. It, um, been uh, sandblasted to give it a, a little more texture. Um, that, that hill is a terribly steep one, and my intent was to uh, build a house into that hill without creating pads or having exposed dirt left over or exposed hillside left over. So. Uh, Later, the interiors will show you that the back of that area wh where the windows are is concrete, and it's a retaining wall. Uh, but it's not a cantilevered retaining wall. It's a, it's a, it acts like a concrete box with the uh, first floor and second floor floors being concrete uh, diaphragms. I misspoke a minute ago, and <laughs> God, where did I get that expression? <laughs> but uh, the roof is wood. but. Uh, and this reta uh, retaining wall for the garden that you see on the left is uh, anchored to the site by a swimming pool. Which you see there. And that swimming pool serves as a dead man to uh, restrain. Now you can see the beginning of the concrete wall. It's a, with a fireplace at one end or the chimney at one end of it anchors as a retaining wall against that steep cliff. None so far. No, it's a, it's a very strong structure. It's a quite heavily engineered. This is the uh, living room. It has a, a brick floor. And the w windows on the right are the ones you saw on the uh, exterior picture. The teak paneling there screens the kitchen on the right side and a, a little den on the left, and that blank panel there screens the powder room. You, the bank, uh, dark panel above the teak wall there is the, where the, the 
roof treatment is uh, redwood boarding. Here's a view from that little den or study that looking towards the fireplace on the left. Oh, it was about 1,800 square feet. It's, it was a fairly small two-bedroom house. And there you can see the stairwell opening leading down to the garage below. Gosh, hundred dollar uh, yard. <laughs> <laughs> this one comes closer to a hundred dollars a yard. Um, this one I built myself um, as a contract. I didn't do any of the manual labor on it, but I handled all the subs on it. And uh, this was ten years ago. So uh, at that time. Around between eighteen and twenty dollars a foot, and that was that was pretty high because uh, it would it would be a thirty dollar a foot house now. Um, well, I've never uh, I don't know whether it's a good fortune or the bad fortune to have unlimited budgets. Um, in many ways, I think uh, it'd be tough to have too much money to spend because you. Um, you have no limitations, and limitations are what create a design. It's a, a discipline. You can have other uh, disciplining factors that help in uh, creating a design, but I guess I'll never uh, forget a lecture I list attended, which uh, Ray Ames spoke. Ray Eames, and it was his contention, and he, his whole lecture was on the theory of limitations and restrictions. And uh, he went up and down the gamut of all art forms, architecture to painting to uh, uh, you name it. And the first thing an artist has to do is to, uh, if, if they're not given to him already, is to set limits himself to work within. And in architecture, a budget can be one of those. As long as it's not unreasonable, a client can't tell you, "I've only got so much to spend, but I want a gold-plated bathtub." You know, th then, uh, then, uh, then everything's shot. But if he tells you, "I want you to use your ingenuity to create a shelter for me," and uh, I want to live comfortably, I want to be warm, I want to have a, a stimulating environment, and then leaves it up to you. Uh, you may today, for instance, uh, resort to some industrial techniques. Uh, there's a house that Frank Gehry did near that house that I showed you a while back for the brother and sister that's done that way. Uh, the neighbors don't know qu quite what to think of it, but once they're inside of it, I took these clients up there and they looked at it. And that looks like a factory, doesn't it? And I said, let's go. And we knocked on the door and there was a musician that owns it. and uh, <coughs> He took us around. It's, it's based on the principle your school is based. It's just a large space that you can um, have, and he had exactly what you have here, these beautiful little space modules for a bedroom and another one for where he had some of his musical equipment. Uh, and these people were, even though they're older people, were youthful enough in their thinking that they began to appreciate the beauty uh, that this structure afforded. And this is what I mean by taking a limitation, and uh, if it's given, and of course this man gave it to himself, um, was a intelligent, uh, adventuresome person that was able to uh, give this limitation to Frank Gehry, and he, he responded by coming up with a, uh, what I thought was a, a beautiful solution to it, and the client was happy, and uh, I, I'm sure Frank Gehry is proud of that piece of work. This is uh, when I mentioned before the slides went on that you uh, 
sometimes get a certain generating idea that around which the whole solution uh, comes about. This, in this case, the client had a as close to an unbillable lot as I've ever had to contend with. It was um, even the lot in that, ho that concrete house. I, I was able to climb a portion of it without <laughs> mountaineering equipment. This one was impossible. I, uh, you'd have to have a rope to hang on to to get down. As we found, and um, what we have here, the the foundations were are steel. There's no. Later on, the city came along and cried and uh, made me put a little 12 by 12 sliver of concrete connecting those posts. But those are uh, six inch wide flange steel columns pounded into the dirt to the point where the resistance was sufficient. The engineer would calculate, uh, knowing what the soil was, that uh, after so many hammers of this uh, pile driver, if it only went so much of a fraction of an inch, then it was in firm enough uh, earth so that they could stop driving any further. Well, naturally, in driving the steel, <coughs> it would be hard to have driven the full length of it. So we drove six-inch steel wide flanges to the point where they were fairly close to uh, the earth. Then they were welded off, and then uh, a similar six-inch wide flange was added on top of it. So it, you have, in effect, a continu uh, continuous steel post. And uh, the lateral bracing you can see on the right bay there consisted of rods just as you have here to brace your brace module. It's a, it was for a bachelor and it was a simple little one bedroom uh, house. And it was done very economically. I, this must have been done 15 to 20 years ago and at that time I'm sure it was under ten dollars a foot. That's right. Well, that's uh, twenty-one years ago. Hmm. Now you know I'm not a young architect. <laughs> you can see some of the joinery of the steel post to the steel beams. Uh, the only wood is uh, the floor and um, roof slabs. I wanted to make those out of steel decking to provide a more compatible relationship, but uh, there the budget came in and I wasn't able to do, uh, do it within the cost I had to spend. Here's your pile driver piling those steel beams in. I'm going to, this is the start of an, another house, which is um, in many ways quite a traditional house. Matter of fact, uh, I would. I would, in describing myself, say that I'm a traditional architect in, uh, in the true sense of the dictionary meaning of the word, which is, uh, comes from the word tradere in Latin, to hand down. Uh, I really see no uh, fault in uh, following traditional means of construction as long as it, didn't, it doesn't uh, interfere with what I'm trying to solve. I think uh, the, the most important thing in my estimation in solving a, particularly a problem of a house for people is the, the, the behavioral one. Uh, if people um, feel more comfortable in um, with materials that they feel happy with, comfortable with, 
uh, I see no reason to do a house like the one I showed just before that uh, represents uh, the use of more industrial techniques. I enjoy, I, I really enjoy both. In this case, um, I, when the people came to me, I told them I couldn't do the house for them because they, their limitations and their expression of uh, uh, traditional architecture meant to them to the way they express it to me, a very eclectic kind of conservatism rather than um, a genuine feeling for tradition. And uh, so they went away and came back a few weeks later after thinking it over. I did, as a matter of fact, I even gave them the name of another architect who, he sh who they should go to. They came back and uh, they said they'd like to adventure with me. They, uh, and so we started this adventure and uh, they, they wanted wood and masonry. They, they just felt that they could only be happy uh, with these natural materials, but uh, they wanted a spatial excitement to the house uh, that they would leave to me. Well, <coughs> in designing the house, Claudio Bacato isn't here tonight, is he? He was the young man that worked with me on this house all the way through it. It was Claudio's brother, Pete. Uh, there'll be a picture of him here doing the construction. Uh, we needed to get redwood that we couldn't get here. We needed long redwood. And so we went up to the north coast of California near Fort Bragg and picked these pieces that were the results of bridges that were wiped out in a, a big flood the previous year. And you can see how gray and age worn they were, all of them at least 50 years old. And here they are on the building site after they've been brought down and cut into the sizes we needed. And are ready. And of course, they've regained their pinkish appearance. Uh, most of them are full of holes and bolts that are through them. The bolts had to be taken out so they could be resawn. But as you see the house later, you'll see all the bolt holes and uh, remnants left from the bridge construction. And here you can see some of the joinery that was done on the ground before we lifted it in place. What I decided to do was to create a uh, skeleton of brick columns supporting redwood members and then filling the whole building with a, um, a curtain wall system I designed of redwood mullions and then either glass or uh, wood panels where I wanted uh, an opaque surface. It's similar to what you'd have in a skyscraper, except that uh, the posts are redwood and the opaque surfaces are, um, there's a sandwich panel of plywood with redwood on one side and on the other side, either the, the plywood painted or uh, more redwood panels. And here's the beginning of construction. You can see the, uh, the brick supporting columns starting up. There's Pete Bocato right there. You recognize him, Ray? The, uh, the columns are hollow and serve to uh, carry all the um, heating ducts your, or your electrical system and your plumbing within them. Because one of the problems of a house like this that has no um, bearing walls other than those columns, and those aren't walls, they're columns, is what do you do with all your uh, your systems? And, uh, it w whether you like the appearance of the house or not, to me it was a fascinating exercise in taking a particular kind of building system that you decided to do and following it out and making it as 
true to an original conception as you possibly can and make it serve a, a function. There's a completed house looking from the beach below. The soil wasn't too good and it was fairly precipitous at some point so that those columns cantilever from their footings. All the earthquake is taken by those columns. There's no diaphragms, no diagonal bracing. Or, uh, it's in Corona del Mar, just south of the jetty. You, if you sail out of there, as I have many times, you'll, you'll see it out there. I was very disappointed with the furnishings of the house. I had talked them into a, someone to work with them on the interior design that would have been more compatible, <laughs> particularly as to scale. I, I don't mind traditional furniture if it's in scale and, and color and, and in character uh, with a house. Uh, but I hate to have some uh, decorator come in with these finicky little things like you see right here in this foreground that are out of scale and out of character. A bolder kind of maybe early American uh, piece uh, wouldn't have been bad, but some of this, uh, as you can see in the foreground, some of the furniture is uh, I, I'm introducing these pictures to show that um, the character that can be given to a space uh, when it accommodates quite a few people. Uh, not that one. Practically all the rooms open into this large uh, central entertaining area. This was taken during the, um, the, the people were uh, heavy drinkers and Episcopalians and, and actually <laughs> the, the, the heaviest drinkers there were the two priests. Uh, I guess one of them shown up there with uh, the acolytes uh, up on the, b but here again there was, um, the whole house really opens up into this big central space and uh, what you see on the left is a bridge going from the master bedroom suite to where the children are, which is the um, children's bedrooms. Big pardon? Uh, let's see, there was uh, 5,200 square feet enclosed area in that house and it came for, uh, to about $110,000. So that was very close to $20 a foot and that was about five years ago. Um, the next job I had was fairly close to uh, this house. It was still in Corona del Mar, but it was north of the jetty. And this was really a steep block. It's uh, unwalkable. And the owner is a man who made his fortune in the concrete business. <laughs> <laughs> and I wanted to pursue this idea of, of a space frame concept or space module structure to do it in, in uh, slightly more modern materials and I, I got him fascinated with the idea since he had made his money that he ought to build a space frame out of concrete and um, since you can't uh, do uh, very much on the site itself, uh, we um, precast the things mostly at a factory and uh, I had them brought out there and you'll see the sections that were precast and uh, and then the big cranes lifting them into place. They, uh, <coughs> we did have to have caissons to support these frames. You would have had to have caissons to support anything because of the deep uh, sliding area slippage on the lot that would have uh, given anything but a very light bungalow a slip down the hill. 
I don't think this was uh, the people on either side in their little wood houses had that problem, but uh, they were showing signs of sliding down the hill already, and the house the size this man wanted had certainly not been safe. You can see the extent of the After they were um, precast and put in place, we sandblasted these columns and uh, stained them. No, we didn't stain them. The, the, the color was in integral with the concrete. And then when we sandblasted, the color came out a little, uh, cut away the latents and produced this sort of brownish color. We had, um, we welded uh, elements of the steel reinforcing um, were exposed. I hope there's a picture here that comes up closer because I don't know if you can see it here or not. Uh, yes, you can see the gaps right here. Well, the steel from this precast member projects up. The steel from that one projects down and the welders would come uh, weld those connections and then dry pack it with uh, cement. <coughs> that area you see floored in right now is the is the uh, is mainly the courtyard plus part of the living room out in front. But uh, there's no living space on the ground at all, so uh, the whole house, as you'll see later, uh, works around a uh, a wood deck courtyard that uh, was in, it's a wood deck in structure, but it was tiled. The front is just practically uh, nothing but uh, uh, garages and an entryway. The entry is just to the right of the planter and from there on to the left is the garage, and that the third, the last bay there, third bay, is a, uh, a guest room off the top level. You can see that the two-story courtyard just to the left of the the front bay. 